Coronation Street Time Life videos. In this edition, we're going to focus on the longest surviving character in Coronation Street, Ken Barlow. Ken was in episode one on the 9th of December, 1960. During his time in the programme, Ken has captured not only the hearts of all of us, the audience, but also the hearts of many a lady resident of Weatherfield. For example, how many names can you fit to these faces? one or two don't worry let me refresh your memory back in 1960 Ken was still at university and was looking forward to his career he was dating that's right Susan Cunningham at the time and was unsure how she would view Coronation Street Oh, that's her name then eh Susan yes Susan Cunningham and is she, and is she a sort of special kind of friend no of not particularly just a girl happens to be in my ear I see well of course Mark you this is only an idea, but um, couldn't you go down into town and collect her and then bring her back here? I think that would please you, Mother. No, uh, it's no good. I couldn't. Oh, well, you know best. No, I, I just couldn't. You wouldn't understand. No, thank well, you. No, it's just that... Uh, well, Coronation Street. Oh, well, what's wrong with Coronation Street? I've never heard you talking that way before. Well, I never pretended to sue, or anybody for that matter, that I came from anywhere else, but... Well, I, I just don't fancy the idea of her actually seeing it. Mm -hmm. It has its good points. I mean, Tekina Sharples. Now, I reckon your friend would lap her up. My place of worship is the Rover's Return, and I'll swap brown ale for me and book any day. <laughs> you see? Oh, yeah, but it's all right talking about it, but I don't want to come in up here. You know, I never thought the day had come when I'd have to say this, but I reckon that that college has turned you into a proper stuck-up little snob, Kenneth Barlow. I'm sorry, love, we weren't expecting company. Mm. Don't worry about me, Mrs. Barlow. Oh, David, get that thing out at road. Oh. I'm not telling you a word of a lie. Let two of them loose together for five minutes and they turn the place into a proper tin. Now, you be quiet, I'll take clock apart again. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, that's a nice way to greet a person. Do you fancy a cup of tea, love? I'd love one. Oh, where are you off? I'm off to put kettle on. Well, that's something new. We haven't done that in years. Oh, David, get out from under oh, my feet. Um, think on you don't fill the kettle for the old street. Well, I should think at my time of life I could be trusted to fill a kettle. I can tell by the time you put it too much on it. Here we're having not hot water bottles. Here, I don't know. Do it yourself, I just... Oh, yeah. Fine. Look, uh, we've obviously got to have this tea, otherwise she'll be offended, but after that, let's make a quick dash for it. Where to? Oh, into town. Oh, don't let's bother about town. What about that funny little Victorian pub on the corner? You mean the Rover's Return? You should just see inside. That's exactly what I want to do. Well, he needn't have worried, because that relationship didn't last very long, and he soon fell head over heels in love with an older woman, Marion Lund. Now, that was something that Ken felt even more unsure about. But that came to rather an abrupt end, much to his surprise. I'd better go. Don't tell your parents about me, not you. Why not? Why do you always want an explanation for everything? I meant what I said. It well, doesn't matter to me. I meant what I said, too. It would matter to other people. They, well, they create problems for us. Yeah, I know. Well, we don't want problems, do we? Better go. You just shaken me when Mr. Walker came up, said he didn't want to see him about me work. No, uh, that's right. It's more of a personal matter. Personal? We have a mutual acquaintance. Oh, well, sure we have quite a few. No, I didn't mean that. I was talking about Miss Lund. 
Oh. What about that? Well, she didn't want to come and tell you herself. I suppose it's only natural. We're engaged to be married, Mary and I. You what? She's told me everything about you. She was very frank. She realizes it should never have happened, and she's sorry. Is she? I'm sorry to have blurted it out like that. I didn't know how else to do it. Well, I suppose it had to come out somehow. Yes. There's something else you ought to know. Marion handed in a resignation a month ago. She left tonight. I suppose it's less embarrassing that way. This must have been a bit of a shock. Yes. Yes, it has. I'm sorry. Oh, well. Cheers. Cheers. Not long after that blow to his ego, Ken was to meet a lady who would play a much bigger role in his life. He was introduced to her by Albert Tatlock, and within the year they were married. It wasn't very long before they started a family. In fact, they had twins, a boy and a girl, Peter and Susan. Well, it's August bank holiday. You ought to be out with some lass. Oh, uh, I don't feel much like it. No, but uh, you, you'll get over it, you know, Kenneth. Here we are. Oh. Oh, you two don't know each other, do you? This is Valerie, my niece. This is Kenneth Barlow. He lives next door. Hello. Hello. Well, why don't you stop and have a cup of tea with us? Yes. No, I mean, I'd like to, but uh, Gran's just making some and she's by herself. Well, go and fetch her in. Let's have a party. Oh. Uh, right. Yes, I will. <laughs> All right. Wow. What about that sermon there? Smiley's taking a photo. Who's going to be on the group, Frank? Oh, well, just the immediate family, I think, Albert. Right. Well, Tetlock's on the left, Barlow's on the right. Oh, I'm right. Sure oh, you've got me. some film in that camera, young fella. Come on, everyone, please. Up for yes, I know, but don't kid yourself, it's for us. It's because our David is a public figure. That's what they come for. They're in for a bit of a disappointment, aren't they? Now, come on, everybody, smile. Don't look so serious, Kenneth. Uh -oh. <laughs> yes, I've got it. And thanks. And, and, and uh, I'd just like to say thank you all very much for all you've done. And you know what happened to the bloke who started thinking, don't you? He finished up on the National Assistant. Right, the drinks are on me! Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. On that lot, eh? How heavy were they? Oh, oh dear, let me think now. The little girl was uh, five pounds three and the little boy was five pounds eleven. Something like oh, that. Which anyway. is great, oh, isn't that? Hey, right which were born first? Uh, the little girl. Ah. Oh. Come on, have a look. Get out of the glasses, Walker. No. Oh, now listen, Ken, dear. These are the first twins we have had in Coronation Street, and Miss Walker and I think we should celebrate with champagne on us. Oh, oh, oh champagne! When the twins were very young, Val had a night out, leaving Ken to babysit. When she returned, she was horrified to find that Ken had nipped out and the living room was ablaze. Ah, uh, scuttled. By Captain Langsdorff, skipper of the Graf Speed, December the 17th, 1939. So now we know. Yeah, right. and now that you've got all that settled, I really am off. Oh, are you going? See ya. You got it all sorted out, have you? Ah, uh, uh, well, look, now I've got one for you. Hmm? How many ships did we use at Battle of Jutland? Jutland? Are no, you joking? Greatest naval battle of the First World War. Can remember it as if it were yesterday. That's where boy Jackie Cornwall won his VC. He was in the light cruiser squadron.
Oh, what can I do after this, sir? Well, what do you want me to say? That I made a stupid mistake? That I shouldn't have gone out and left them? Well, okay, I know, I agree. Val, will you listen? Another five minutes and this whole house could have gone up. Peter and Susan lying upstairs alone. What chance do you think they'd have had? Please, Val, don't rub it in. How do you think I... One don't night I know. a week I go out. One night. I don't know, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I'm expecting too much. But you're supposed to be the one with all the brains. You're always telling me how stupid I am. Don't talk such rot. There isn't a kid in this street to do what you did. Go out leaving two babies alone. A fire halfway up the chimney and a maiden of clothes drying. And for what? To go drinking at the Rovers? That's not true, and you know it. I want to get some cigarettes. Well, then what took you so long? I was here five minutes before you even showed your face. Where were you? I told you, love. I got involved Every in a Every day you read about it in the papers, and you think this can never happen to me. But it can, and it very nearly did, and all because of you. <laughs> and I'll leave you. Well, after that, Ken's marriage to Val went steadily downhill, and it wasn't helped by a brief liaison he had with a reporter called Jackie Marsh. Hello, Jackie. Ken? I was uh, just on my way to a meeting, and I suddenly remembered that you live round here, so... Uh... Oh, here I am. Oh, come in. Let me check your coat. Uh, no, no, I won't stop. Why not? Well, you're obviously going out. Correction, I was going out. Sean Connery can do without me tonight. Any other objections? None I can think of. There we all were. Twenty-three nine-year-old little innocents bent over the homework, with me walking up and down like a bosun's mate. <laughs> stop doing it, Wilkins. Brown, put that toffee out. Not on the floor, boy. I sound like Lord Snooty and his gang. When well, suddenly I spotted young Hickson whispering and giggling in the corner. So, Hickson, I said, what are you whispering about? Please, sir, talking about the new geography, Mrs. Miss Lloyd, sir. Oh, what are you saying about her? Oh, sir, I was just saying, sir, she's a smashing bit of stuff, sir. Oh, is she? Well, you know, anyway. So what, You mean I, there's more? Oh, yeah. So I told him to go to the headmaster and tell him what he said. And do you know what he said? The cheeky pig, eight years old. <laughs> no. He went to the headmaster and he said, please, sir, Mr. Barlow said I'm to tell you that Miss Lloyd is a smashing bit of stuff. <laughs> Still, your hair doesn't seem to have changed colour anyhow. Oh, it's got its compensations. I must say I prefer teaching 16-year-olds now. Of course, it doesn't compare with journalism for money and glamour, as I said. So who's glamorous? You're fishing. Yes. No, I wouldn't say you were glamorous. Well, go on. So you're very... vivid. Am I? Yes, very. Well, I'd better be off. I, uh... So soon? Yes, sir. Uh, only said I'd be away two hours, you know. Thanks for not chucking me out, anyway. No need to thank me. Come again? Can I? Well, I wouldn't ask you if I didn't mean it. Well? Yes. When? Um, how about next Wednesday? I'll be here. Good. Well, uh, see you next Wednesday, then. I can. All right, if there's nothing sinister about it, why don't you tell me where it came from, then? A fine exhibition of trust between husband and wife, isn't it? Trust? Who the hell do you think you are to talk to me about trust? What do you mean? You know what I mean, all right. It's been going on for weeks, weeks! What's been going on? Nothing's been going on. Good! Great, it's marvellous, isn't it? Everything's fine, isn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. Nothing's been going on. I don't know you. I don't know who you are. I'm not all that difficult to find out about. Let me try listening to me when I talk to you. Talk! You sit in that damn chair staring at the wall. What do you think about? Lots of things. What about us? We haven't been near each other for months. Oh. Oh, leave me alone. 
better and out of your way a bit, aren't you? What do you mean? All this devoted husband stuff. Yep, that's me. Val. What? There's something I want to say to you, love. Something you've got to know. Do you know what I mean? I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do, love. Can I just talk about it for a minute? Explain. You don't mean all those union meetings? Or was it night school? It wasn't I either, love. You know what I'm talking about. Well, I suppose you're talking about your girlfriend. I thought you were never going to mention it. I don't want to know about it, Ken. I'm sure you had your reasons. No, love, I didn't have any reason. Listen, Val, I, I'm just an ordinary bloke, you know. There's nothing special about me. Yes, I noticed. Look, I want to be as honest as I can about this, but it's not simple, you know, this sort of thing. You get, you get caught up in circumstances and you, and you can't help it. I mean, these things happen, but there's nothing you can do about it, because at the time, you just don't know what the hell you're all about. Well, when will you find out what you're all about? Oh, no, you don't understand. I don't want to understand. You just want to share this with me so that you've got no. somebody to share your guilt. No, 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 I don't want to share anything. I'm just trying to explain. The only thing that you've explained is that given a certain set of circumstances, you don't know how you'd react. Yes. You're trying to justify what you've done. No! Look, there's right and there's wrong. Where do you fit? Oh, Val, please. For heaven's sake, what? Don't close up on me. What do you expect me to do? Well, how much do you know, love? You know, about me and... Uh... Little Miss Marshmallow. Talk sense, though. There's no need to talk at all. I don't know if she had blue eyes or a wooden leg. I just know from the way you've been for the past few months that she existed. She did exist. Did. All right. So I take my life on from there. Look, love, I am married to you, but if it's going to work, you've got to know all about me. Don't panic. I will know. There's time. I do know why I married you. And why you'll stay married? Yes, I know all the reasons. Good. I always thought I had you. But do I have you? <laughs> oh, you know me. I'm anybody's performance. Especially yours. In 1968, Ken, Val and the twins moved across the street to live in the new flats. This was to be a new start for both of them. But it was while living there that an event occurred that changed Ken's life for good. Having lost his mother in an accident in 1961 and his brother David in another accident in 1970, Ken was devastated when in 1971 Val was electrocuted when she attempted to mend a plug. And it wasn't only Ken who was suffering. Uncle Albert couldn't understand how such a thing could have happened to Valerie. Hello. Oh, hi. Yeah, I know, love, but you've no idea. When I got the dress out, the hem had come unpicked. And... <laughs> Look, you just have to wait. I haven't got another dress, and my hair's still wet. Well, come as you are. Wet hair, no dress, it's all the rage. Don't be so bashful. Oh, come on, got to put your face on. Look, we're... why not come with the one that God gave you? We both happen to like it. Look, give me about half an hour. Well, 20 minutes and I'll be fit to be seen. Yes, well, you're my husband, so it's a bit different. <laughs> That's a bit cheeky, even for you. Soon as I can. Bye. <coughs> yeah, she'll, um, she'll be along in about half an hour. They were very good. They did everything they could. Everybody did. Uh, Ken. Albert's in the back, mate. Uncle Albert, yeah. Come on, he's in the living room. I'll take you through. Yeah, 
Elizabeth, would you like to pour two glasses of brandy for Kenneth and Mr. Tatlock? Yeah. Kenneth's back, Albert. I'll see you a bit later on, most likely. A nighty. Then they ask you to bring a face cloth and a nighty. Don't speak, Ken. Don't tell me. You don't want to be a any help she didn't suffer. Drink this, I'm going. Apparently, Val wasn't breathing when they brought her out of the flat. His oppo had that uh, oxygen thing on her all the way to the hospital, but she didn't come round at all. Must have been the fumes then. Or the fire? No. Now, what they think happened, they only think, they don't know. You see, when they found Val, she was lying next to an electric fire that had fallen over. They think that is what started the big fire. So it was the fire? No. She was dead before the fire started. She was electrocuted. That's what they reckon, electrocuted. But how? Well, the fireman, one of the firemen told Jack that uh, there was a faulty switch a faulty plug on Val's hairdryer. Oh, no. His theory is, you see, that she had uh, both the hairdryer plug and the electric fire plug in an adapter. It happened when she plugged the adapter into a wall socket. An electric plug? You mean two kids have lost their man just because of an electric plug? It's no consolation, it's no comfort, I know. But the ambulance men turn out about a dozen times a month for incidents involving plugs. You're right, it isn't any comfort. I'm just taking Uncle Albert home. I should be staying with him tonight. Are they all right? Yeah, they're fast asleep. Yeah. Well, I think I'll go and sit in the kids' room for a bit. I've had my life. I've had a good run. Why couldn't they take me instead of Valerie? Sit you down here. No, that's all right. Go on, I grow standing up. Hey, where's that tea? You wouldn't last too long in my mob, I'll tell you. Do you know, it's ten years of September since we buried your mother. Nay, it's never that long. It is, you know. September 1961, from next door, number three. Wait, right. I am you're right. Ten years. Oh, it were a terrible day. Only it all went off very well. Right, tea up, everyone. Well, about time, I know. Uh, Luke, I've, uh, I've made you some sandwiches. I think you ought to eat some of it. Mr. Barlow, 
We're ready now. Val's mum and dad took the twins to live with them in Glasgow while Ken tried to pick up the pieces of his life. At work, one of his fellow teachers, a girl called Olive Rowe, showed an interest in him, but Ken wasn't ready for any form of relationship just yet. Sometime later, when the twins came down from Scotland for a holiday in Blackpool, he surprised his neighbours by introducing them to a lady called Yvonne Chapel. I've never seen her before. I have. I can't think where. <laughs> okay. Is that all you came for? Oh, well, if you're just going a bit later on to give a fire a bit of a pull, I'll bank it up now. Yes, I'll do that. You've got to keep the damp out of these houses. She once put in a way paddling at her time of life. Well, you're only young once. Thank the Lord. Hey, you bumped into them. You mean, uh, you hear they bumped into us? Yes, we just waved across the sand to them. I have been told that the news had got out, if it is news. Well, as long as it's not on the secret list and out like that, I hope you won't mind my saying I've just come across her. She said she was going over. Seems an agreeable girl. Comely. Yes, I think so, too. But if you have any words of wit, warning or wisdom, Mrs Sharples, I'd save them, because I don't need them. Well, I had something in mind to say, yes. Well, it might be a little premature. Funny that. That was the word I was going to use. Look, allow me to decide when it's soon uh, enough. Look, I'm not talking about you mourning. I'm only saying it might be a little bit hasty if you go getting involved. Has anybody said anything about that? No, they haven't. Well, there's no rule that says a widower shouldn't choose his own friends. And that includes women. I'm just saying, spread your net as wide as possible. Take your time. Adjust yourself. And now I'm going. All right. Goodbye. You won't forget that fire, will you? Why do you say that? Do you want me to forget it? I mean, Minnie Colwell's fire. All right, here we are. Oh, and the uh, children sent that for you. <laughs> That's you in the front there, looking like Mick Jagger. Thanks for nothing. Which one are you? That, that one there? Uh, no, no, that's Blackpool Tarex, but apparently <laughs> we bear an uncanny resemblance, particularly when I've been dieting and I'm wearing my shorts. <laughs> anyway, listen, I got them to sign it, so you hang on to that. It could be worth a fortune in a few years. And uh, this is from me to you. Oh, thank you. Can I open it now? Help yourself. How are um, Mr. and Mrs. Tatlock? Oh, fine, fine. Mrs. Dadlock reckons she's ten years younger since she's been looking after the kids. All right, is it? Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's... one of my favourites. Is it? That's <laughs> a great relief, because when it comes to picking perfume, I'm tone deaf or whatever the nasal equivalent is. What made you choose this one? Nothing special. It wasn't... <laughs> it's lovely. What a favourite of Val's, you mean? Was it? No. She never used it. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. And this... It's your list. List? Yes, a list of suggestions, suggestions, but if you've got any bright ideas, feel free to change them. Suggestions for what? For the sandwich filling, for the picnic, but don't buy any bread and butter, because we've got plenty of that in the kitchen at home. I see. And what are you going to be doing while I'm doing all this? Well, I am going to be out looking for 007. 007? Mm-hmm. I'm going to try and get a borrowed sports car. So, I will see you back home in half an hour. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> right, are we all set then? Mm, I think uh, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, corkscrew? Corkscrew. You know, I always pick mine. So <laughs> always forget the corkscrew. You never end up picking the cork out with a penknife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you manage to borrow the car all right? Uh, yes, it was made of mine at college. He owed me a favour, so I went round reminding him that he owed me a favour. Very useful things, favours, in fact, aren't they? Mm. Why 007? Why 007? Very good reason, because one of the students got a crush on him. 
because she said that he reminded her of Sean Connery and he'd been trying to live it down ever since. <laughs> right, are we, uh, are we ready for off then? Well, yes, but you haven't told me where we're going yet. Cannot be done, I'm afraid, just cannot be done. Why but not? sealed order some M, even I don't know where we're going. <laughs> oh, have I come at a bad time? Uh, well, let's say you just caught us, Hilda. Oh, yes. Well, off for the day then? That's right. Oh. Had a nice time in Scotland, did you? Fine. How's everybody? Oh, they're very well. Peter and Susan? Oh, they're fine too. Mm. Decided to stop on a bit longer, have they, with the grandma? Just what exactly was it you wanted, Hilda? We are in a bit of a hurry. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, change for 50p for the gas meter. Sorry. No change. Oh. Oh, well, perhaps you're a uh, young lady. Sorry. No. Yeah. Well, I'll uh, try the rovers then. <laughs> Why not? Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's quite incredible, really, when you think about it, isn't it? What is it? Well, hundreds of times I've driven over little humpback bridges and I've got a glimpse of white cruisers going along green canals and I've said to myself, that is the way to spend a day, yet this is the first time I've ever done anything about it. Do you mean to tell me that this is the first time you've actually driven one of these things? That's right. Well, I think you might have warned me before you lured me aboard. Oh, don't worry, love. Show me an Englishman and I'll show you a sailor. We're a seagoing nation, oh, you know. Oh, yes. And when did you last go to sea? I took the kids over to New Brighton and the boat was bucketing about and I was as sick as a dog. So, <laughs> they say Nelson used to be sick the first day, I don't know, was it Gregory Peck? You know, you're getting me very worried. Well, I'd say touch wood if I could, but I'm sure everything around here is just fiberglass, so you'd have a job. <sighs> Do they mind very much when you are leaving? Peter and Susan? No, not very much. In fact, it was all Mrs. Tatlock could do to stick around long enough to say goodbye, so I think it's better that way. What did Mrs. Um, Ogden mean this morning when she said about them staying a bit longer? Oh, she must have been talking to Alma then. I told her just before I rang you. Told her what? The, uh, the news about the twins. About them staying up in Scotland. Permanently? Well, for the foreseeable future, yeah. I see. Um, why are they staying? I mean, it's it's not because of us. Oh, no, do me a favour. No, it's the best thing for everybody. It's a much better school than Bessie Street. They're settled, they're happy, and there's no unpleasant memories. I see. Mind you, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't say that... I do see that it simplifies things for us. I mean, it does sort of move the final obstacle, doesn't it? Obstacle? To us getting married. Will you marry me, Evan? Can we talk again, please? I'd rather we didn't. It's fairly important. Aren't we all right as we are? No. Look, sometimes it, it's best just to let things drift. I mean, decisions only hurt. They, they don't improve things. I asked you to marry me and you haven't given me an answer. No. Well, I'd like an answer now. I'd rather not. Because you're not sure? Yes. That's not true, is it? Yes. I'm sure. Are you? Meaning? Look, in the, there's a wall between us, a, a gap, a barrier, something. Oh, well. No, not just... Well, what then? Well, it hasn't exactly been a happy relationship, has it? I mean, both of us with unhappy past, overshadowing the present and... Oh, it's a very comfort. It's just not me that you're blaming, then. Of course not. Look, I, I know, I mean, I know I'm scared of marrying again. I mean, once bitten, twice shy, as they say. Yes, I understand that. I understand that. But even if you hadn't been married once, we're both well past the age of wide-eyed innocence. But does that mean that you'll not get married again? I mean, I will, cynical though I am. Ken, can you honestly say, when you look at me, you sometimes don't see Val? Val's becoming a receding memory, you know. Sometimes now it's a tremendous effort to even remember what she looked like. Now, three months ago, a month ago, I, I would have thought that that couldn't happen. I believe you. Well, then? I believe you now, this minute. Not tonight, not when a passing train wakes me up. 
Not when I'm working tomorrow. Then, I think, I'm just a replacement. I look a bit like her. I even act a bit like her. And that's why he wants me. Is that such a bad thing? What? You've had one bad marriage, right? Yes. And I had a good one. I didn't realize it at the time, but it was good, and it was getting better. Now, supposing you're right, supposing I have married you as a vowel substitute, which I deny emphatically, is that such a bad thing to want to continue a marriage that was getting better? You know what they call that in hospital? What? A transplant. They fail more often than they work. I'm prepared to take a chance. You wanted an answer? Please. It, it has to be no, Ken. No, I, I would have liked to have been the, the second Mrs. Barlow, but I, I can't. I can't. Six months later, Norma Ford, who worked at the corner shop, called on Ken to ask a favour. Ken liked her, and their friendship grew over the weeks. Norma had hopes for their relationship, but Ken, well, he wasn't sure he wanted that sort of a companion. I like doing things for you. Ken was content to remain friends with Norma, and in fact, he was to abuse that friendship later. In the meantime, he befriended an American couple who were over here for a holiday. Ken took on the responsibility of showing Faye Marie the cultural sites in and around Manchester. The next serious relationship for Ken was Elaine Perkins, his headmaster's daughter. This lady led him a merry dance, and when she finally rejected him, Ken went back to Norma to help him get over her. But then he got a better offer from Rita Littlewood. Feeling antisocial today, are we, Kenneth? No more than usual, Headmaster. Well, mix, my boy. Mix. No, I'm all right, honest, you know me. Always the aloof spectator is my favourite role. And uh, I do see rather a lot of this mob during the term time, don't I? Go on, I'll introduce you to Elaine. You've not met her before. Oh, I'm right, then. <laughs> Elaine, well, this is Kenneth Barlow. I think I've mentioned him. Careful, Elaine. He can be rather sardonic, can't we all? Hello, Kenneth. Elaine? He was the inspiration behind our successful football team last year. Huh? <laughs> quite accidentally. Yes, I never had you down as the sporty kind. No, I'm quite definitely not. Why, too lazy or too cerebral? Lazy and no talent for sport. I'm afraid my coordination is not what it should be. He's quite brainy, though. <laughs> Facile, I think the word is, like everybody younger than me. Oh, youth, I do abhor thee. There's not much to recommend it, is there? Look, come on, Miss Dodds, I'll get you another drink. I won't be happy till I see you doing Knees Up, Mother Drown with old Moses Marsh over there. <laughs> Headmaster. <laughs> He's not nearly as reactionary as he pretends, is he? Far from it. And what's a brainy, sardonic man like you doing teaching at Bessie Street? Oh, what else should I be doing? Leading something, like the opposition. Or the government, if you're that way inclined. I don't think I can muster the necessary self-deception. Now, what do you do for a living? Nothing at the moment. Oh, you accuse me of being lazy. Well, I'm sort of working up to something. Oh, yes, like what? Well, like I don't really know. Fancy that. I spend, what, ooh, not far short of 20-odd years at school and university, working my brains to the bone. I get a degree. And a very good one, I'm told. Very. But at the end of it all, I still don't really know what I want to do. I mean, not passionately, anyway. I mean, I've tried one or two things, but nothing grabbed me. Still, you've had a very liberal education. That's true enough. But still very much an innocent abroad in the real world. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Kenneth, I think I asked you if you wanted to come for a meal tonight, didn't I? Oh, didn't you say you had something on? In which case, I'll have to ask somebody else. Uh, I don't remember saying I had something on, Headmaster. You'll come, then. I'd be delighted. Don't be such an old hypocrite. You lap them up. I'm always catching them as he's furtively switching off Bugs Bunny. Personally, I love cartoons. Yes, yeah, so do I. Although, you know, I think that's the first time I ever admitted it. Why? Snob, I suppose. Well, there is a lot of snobbery about TV, isn't there? Yes, I enjoy a good documentary and play every afternoon. Nobody ever seems to watch anything popular, at least not to hear them talk. What people watch and what they say they watch are two totally different things. She's an anarchist, destroying all our well-loved institutions like snobbery and hypocrisy. Observing them, I don't think they'll ever be destroyed. Oh, my God, and a realist to boot. Is there no end to this woman? Don't worry, Kenneth. It just seems like that. Have a good dinner, did you? 
Buckle up, but since I came in, I think you must have asked me that question about 1,800 times, to be precise. What he's really asking is how you got on with the headmaster's daughter. Yes, I know what he's really up. How do you know? Oh, he told me all about it. Oh, he did, did he? Well, I didn't like to wonder the official secrets act. As a matter of fact, she just happens to be a rather pleasant girl that I've chatted to a couple of times, and that is all. Yay. Well, anyway, I think the country's had its ration of romance for this year, and we don't want to surf it, do we? That way we may sicken and so die. Speak for yourself, young man. And in future, I'd be very glad if you didn't go banding my every move right, left and centre. Well, look, when you get to my age, you run out of small talk. Oh, yes, and since when has my personal life been small talk? Now, look, you just this minute said there was no to it. Now, make your flipping mind up. Do you collect records? I got a few, yes. You must go around here. Hear them sometime. What about Uncle Albert? Oh, well, we could always lock him in the bathroom for a couple of hours. What's he like? Well, to hear him talk, you'd think he killed more Germans than Audie Murphy. He sounds sweet. <laughs> That's hardly the word I would use. I think he's an acquired taste, though. Was he living with you when your wife died? No, he wasn't, actually. I see. It's a long story. I must tell you sometime. Yes, you must. Tomorrow, if you like. Tomorrow? Yes, I think you're going down to the countryside, actually, Derbyshire way. Oh, that sounds nice. Would you like to come with me? Oh, I'm afraid I can't, Ken. I've got something else lined up. Oh, I see. Sorry. Timothy, is it? It might be. Clean out of antistatic fluid. What? Antistatic fluid for the dust bucket. Oh. That means a trip to Ardacre's in town, and I'm afraid I just can't spare the time this afternoon. Well, I'm going into town, headmaster. I could get it for you. You'll not mind? Not at all, no. What do I ask for? Oh, just show them that. They know what you want. Right. I'll answer it. Well, I'll be off then. Yes, just show them that. They'll fix you up. Want any money? No, no, I'll settle up with you when I get back. Goodbye. Can you have on? No, it's all right. Don't bother. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Well, it can't be helped. Will you call me when you get back? All right. Bye. Who was that? Timothy, blast him. He's got to stay over for some meeting or other. He won't be able to make it tomorrow. I see. Ken's coming back, is he? Yes. He's coming back. Who sure are you, you know? You're shiftless. You think so? Yeah. You always have been a bit that way, but since our Valerie went, you've gone from bad to worse. Oh. In what particular way? Would you say I was shiftless, Uncle Albert? Well, you're all as gadded about all over the place, aren't you? You think so, do you? You're not getting any younger, you know. Oh, no, 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 I know. One foot in the grave already, I know. Now, look, if you take my advice, you'll forget all about this headmaster's daughter and settle down. But then, Uncle Albert, there is, of course, always the other alternative. What? Mm. I could always settle down with the headmaster's daughter. Never believe the weatherman again. In future, I shall ask your father about the weather. He's quite a man, his dad. He's got quite a daughter. Thank you. Did you enjoy today? Very much. Honestly, even though I was rushing around and chatting up the notes. No, it was a wonderful day. I'm glad. Look, I'll tell you what, why don't we round it off? Why don't we go somewhere this evening? I know a little place out in Cheshire where we could sit and have a meal and look out across the field. Oh, I'd love to. Good, good. But I can't. Another date? No, it's not a date. It's just that I promised John I'd look in and say goodbye. Where's he going? The moon? Brussels, common market business. I told you he was in wine. Yeah, well, he should be in formaldehyde. I'm not jealous. I'm not of course jealous. I'm jealous. I'm a fella. No need to be jealous. Did you know the Romans once had vineyards on the banks of the River Severn? That this country once produced a wine which was considered to be one of the finest in Europe? Are you sure you won't put him off? I can't. I didn't put you off. And I've been honest with you. Well, in that case, I'd better shove off. I'll be in touch. Please. Well, look, eh? Do I? Yes, yes. yes. Enjoy the match? Oh, very much, yes. Did you enjoy the wine? The wine? Uh, excellent. Goodbye, Len. I'll phone you. Please. Goodbye, Martin. No, it's all right. I'll, I'll see myself now. Well, my lady? Well, what? Would you mind telling me just exactly what game you're playing at? Dad, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Mysterious creatures. You were in. Oh, that's great, Tim. Honestly. Yeah. No. No, just someone, a friend. Hmm. <laughs> OK, listen. Yeah. Thanks for calling. Yes, I will. Bye. Mm. Tim.
Yes, I gathered that. And what did Tim have to say? Oh, he said, why didn't I go to Brussels? What for? There's a thing happening, a sort of political, something very political. Or a march or a demonstration or something. That's what you think of as politics. No, it's, um, it's mainly economists, but it's a very good excuse to go to Brussels. Oh, is it? That's what you were talking about, somewhere we had to go before the end of the week? That's right, yeah. Are you going? Yes, of course. Why, of course? Well, because I want to, because Tim asked me, and because it's already partly arranged. Is Tim a lover or a friend? Does that matter? Yes. Why? Well, just before the phone rang, I was going to say something. It was a declaration. Ken, please don't. Well, it's already out now. Would, would you mind taking one of these, please? Yes, uh, I'm in love with you. Have you thought about what you're saying? Oh, yes, I've thought about it. I've thought about lots of things. That I love you. And you're the woman I want to live with. Tell me something. What? If you don't agree with marriage, how about living with somebody? With you? No, I said with anybody. If I loved them, yes. It means I still don't qualify. Well, your lot go in for it, don't they, living together? Not especially. I would have thought they would. Why? Well, weekends in Brussels, it all sounds very permissive. And I said something funny. You can sound so old-fashioned. I'm not against people living together. I'm sure you're not. Then what? Well, it's just your attitude to my crowd, as you call them. They haven't all got two heads, you know. They're no more permissive than the butcher's boy who nips upstairs to his girlfriend's bedroom when her parents have gone out to the pub. Attitude? What attitude? Well, for want of a better word. It's provincial. It's this town. If you like, it's a typical English cliché. Stiff, reserved, unable to take people for what they are. Because... Because what? Because basically you're not sure of yourself. Well, thanks very much for the character reference. I'm sorry, I... I well, at least I know now why you turn me down, don't I? I mean, I might have gone through life thinking just because you didn't fancy me, I got the wrong hormones or something. I said I'm sorry. But all the time, it's going to be a stiff provincial twit. Well, you weren't born a million miles from here, you know. No, but I've gone a million miles, figuratively speaking. And I haven't. Well, have you? No, but I could have. I think you could have, too. Well, at least we've cleared the air, haven't we? Like the man says, ask no questions, you get told no lies, or no unpleasant truths about yourself. Good night, Elaine. Good night, Elaine. Ken! I'd say that there went a man who was crossed in love. And the rest. Oh, dear. Kenneth is a man that needs his pride. You didn't dent it, did you? I rather think I did. You're in it too, Kenneth. And Bobby. What was all that about, then? She's off on one of her flights of fancy. She lives in a world of her own, does Mrs. Corwell. She's be envied, then. Oh, touch of the moodies, have we? Not especially, no. You could have fooled me. I was wondering... No, you can't use our light fitting to hang yourself from. No, I was wondering if you'd like a night out. A drink and a meal. Think you might cheer yourself up, do you, if you took me out? It's not the reason I'm asking. I'm sorry, Ken, I've uh, got something else on. Well, another time, then. Yeah. Ken, I could cancel what I've got on. Pick up at eight. You must be daft. I know. Your chain. Ta. You mind? No. Oh, what are you doing with yourself? Becoming uh, very philosophical. What about? What else? Men. Funny, because I'm becoming very philosophical about women. Somebody give you the push? In the nicest possible way, right over the cliff. Well, at least you know where you are, heading for the floor. You'll bleed a bit. Me? I'll choke to death on custard pies, because that's where I keep getting, a big custard pie. You know, now I come to think of it, I think that's what I got. It must be the most ignominious fate of all to be stood on the edge of a cliff and to be pushed over it with a custard pie in your face. It was serious, was it? Half serious. My half. 
Sorry. Ah, uh, so I was just out of my league. There were other fellows more glamorous, more successful, more wealthy and more interesting than me. Oh, you have got it bad. Self-pity. I know I'm making it sound like she's a bit of a bitch, but she wasn't at all. It just... Wasn't on. Yeah. Anyway, she's gone off to the continent now with somebody. Snap. Oh, yeah, but Len's gone off for council reasons, hasn't he? Oh, yeah, too right. All very important. Love to take your kid, but can't be done. Except not only could it be done, has been done. You mean... One of the other fellas took his fiancée, right? Oh, well, I won't make any comment about that. You don't have to. The way his head works is about as subtle as neon lights. Drop around. There's a bottle of scotch it'll give me great pleasure to polish off. Left by Furkler. And we can curse the world together. What about eating? Oh, I'll knock some at all. Oh. What's the matter? Have you got some at all? No. Uh, well, not really, no. It's, it's a loose arrangement that would be better all round if I broke it. Well, if you do. Okay, yes, I will. I'll uh, see you about eight o'clock. All right. Oh, well, excuse me. I want to yeah, have a word no, with that. Go yes, I'll anyway. see you then. Oh, bless you. Oh, can I do anything to help? No. You go sit down. What is it? What is it you're doing there? Get all. Not having you knowing my secrets? Hmm. That's, uh... Tarragon, isn't it? Clever boy. Well, I used to do a bit, you know. Oh. Oh, well, I'm glad I didn't do the spam fritters then. Well, I must say, that's more or less what I expected. Well, for that, you can go and lay the table. Right. Any road. You're too good looking for spam fritters. Cheers. Cheers. Pint of bitter. Wrong again, darling. Bottle of red wine, please. Oh, yes. Uh, we've only got rosé. But is it dinner by candlelight? How did you guess? Mm. <laughs> That'll be 80. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Thank, Thank you. you. For the cosy little date over at the cabin, Ken. Yes. All right. Where'd you get it from? How's that for timing? Fine, fine. And I've got a drink, whether I want it or not. Well, you didn't object last night. Um, <laughs> no, I uh, wasn't in the objecting mood. So I noticed. And if I may point out, neither were you. Oh, that's all right then, isn't it? Mutual consent. Yeah, or mutual something or other. Meaning? Dis disappointment, mutual pique. You know, it's funny, really, when you think about it. I mean, I can say to myself, well, Elaine Perkins, somebody wants me, so there. But she will never know, and if she did... She couldn't care less. Yeah, I wouldn't ruffle one of her feathers. And you think it's the same with me? One in the eye for Len? Wasn't it? Yeah. And he couldn't care less either. So what are we in it for? I'd say the hell of it. Mutual consolation and the hell of it. Well, good enough reason. Side, it hurts no one. This mutual understanding between Rita and Ken was all very well as long as it lasted, but as usual, something or someone came along to change things. This time it was someone from Ken's past who reappeared to put Rita's nose well and truly out of joint. Oh, hello. Is that the uh, Department of Education? Yeah. Uh, could I have Mr. Cheadle's office, please? Thank you. Oh, hello. Uh, ah. Uh, do you know what time you'll be back? Well, could you ask him if he could give me a ring? It's just about the supply teacher at Bessie Street. That uh, wouldn't be Mr. Barlow, would it? That's right. Ken Barlow? Yes. I uh, don't think I know. Should. You had enough to say for yourself the last time we met. That voice seems familiar. It's Janet. Janet Reed. Janet! How are you? Well, it must be a couple of years. It must be. How are things with you, anyway? Oh, fine, fine. Same as ever, you know. And the twins? Must be getting quite grown up by now. Yes, yes, they are. I've just got back from Glasgow, as a matter of fact. Oh, they're still up there, then? Yes, they are. I thought you might have found a mother for them by now. <laughs> they don't come with trading stamps, you know. I do know. I have the same trouble. Uh, you're not married yet, then? No. Oh. How long have you been working there? I thought you were at the town hall. Well, I was, till a couple of months ago. Then I got the idea I was being treated like part of the furniture. Perhaps it was the way the boss used to hang his coat on me in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Um, look, uh, would you like to come out for a drink sometime? Love to. Well, uh, how about tonight? Tonight? Yeah. Uh, too fast for you? Uh, well, no, why not? All right, so what time do you finish? 5.30. Right, OK. Well, I've got one or two things to finish off here, so I'll meet you at six o'clock at the Rovers. Uh, 
Or would you rather meet somewhere else? Two years is a long time, Ken. The Rovers will be fine. Good. See you at six, then. Do you mind if I take the weight oh. off my feet? No, help yourself, love. As long as you don't block my view. Ah, you decided to come back then, did you? Uh, yes, yes, hello. I got back about dinner time. Well, it's not long to wait, I don't suppose. Sorry, I'm not with you. No, you weren't with me the night you went to Glasgow either, were you? Remember? I enjoy getting myself tarted up like a dog's dinner to sit in front at telly on my own. Didn't you get my message? No, I didn't get any message. Oh, fuck. Who? Uncle Albert. I told him to let you know before I left. No one said anything to me. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have told him myself. I was in such a tearing hurry. Mm. Maybe you should. Forgive him? Now, that all depends, doesn't oh, it? On what? On tonight. Look, give me half an hour to get uh, myself sorted uh, out and then... No, can... sorry. No? No, I'm afraid I've got someone waiting for me. You have to excuse me tonight. Some other time there. Okay. Hello. Uh, Hello. Sorry I'm late. I haven't been waiting long. Really. No. Yeah. Just like old times, isn't it? Uh, Janet Reed turned out to be the stabilising factor Ken needed in his life. He introduced her to the twins and took her to meet his in-laws in Scotland. They approved of her and Ken and Janet were married there. When they returned to the street, Ken knew that the first and most serious hurdle would be Uncle Albert, but after some initial reservations, Albert took to Janet without any difficulty. Right. Well, this is where we give everyone a big shock. Are you ready, Mrs. Barlow? This is Janet, Uncle Albert. How do you do? Hello, Uncle Albert. I've heard a lot about you. Oh, he talks about me, does he? Never stops. Right, well, uh, well sit yourself down. There's plenty to eat. Oh, it looks lovely. I suppose we can eat that too if we try hard enough. What? Ken's not had our meal since breakfast, so I called and got some place on the way back. Pickering's was still open. I got enough for three. I hope you like place. Oh, oh, aye. Right. Place and chips for three then. You've got a chip pan? Aye. And some potatoes, I hope. I couldn't get any potatoes. Well, I've got a few. Right. Lead me to your stove. You well, you hold your rush. Give me that. Now sit yourself down. And you pour her out a cup of tea. I go and feel a few potatoes. I'm not all that helpless, you know. <laughs> nice one, Mrs. Barlow. Although they got off to a good start, this marriage was to end tragically. Janet had ambitions. She wanted to buy a house away from Coronation Street. She wanted to socialise with her posh friends. When she wanted the children to go to private schools, it was the end for Ken. Come and sit down. Uh, no, no, I want to get this thing organised while it's still in my head. Please. They won't take a minute. I've uh, got a bottle of wine for you. Oh, excellent. I've got some hemlock for Len Ferkler. What? Well, well, come and tell me about it. Yeah, they tore him apart. He should have been there, really. I'm looking for that, that uh, red folder of mine. What's this? What do you think it is? Oh, what's he doing there? Well, we can talk about it, can't we? I mean, it has been mentioned. Yes, and I told you what I think about it. But you haven't even seen the place. You don't know anything about it. And I don't want to. Well, I'm sorry, I do. Why should I bring my children all the way down here and then put them into a boarding school? Why should I want them down here at all? I'm the one that'd be tied to them, not you. When you married me, you knew. You knew I wanted them back! And if you want them near you, you can come and see the headmaster of this place. It's near enough. You bitch. I'm just telling you the truth. You never wanted them back here at all, did you? No. Doesn't leave anything at all.
that was in 1974, and Janet would drop back into Ken's life on and off for the next three years. During that time, Ken had several lady friends, nothing very serious, you understand, but he did try to keep himself busy. For instance, there was Peggy Barton, the union organiser at the warehouse where Ken now worked. That reminds me. Oh, you'll scalp me if I don't go and get oh, well, the Oh, I'll give you a lift. There's no need. Never said there was. All right. He even consulted a computer dating agency and met a Mavis Armitage. Well, number six is a certain Miss Mavis Armitage, who, as you have guessed, likes good books, art, music and outdoor activities and children. She is also extrovert, creative and practical. Mm. Nah, no, number five, she's the one. Yeah, yeah definitely. So. Well, I think you're rotten the lot of you. It's like, like a flipping auction. They ask for it, don't they? I mean, they're on that list because they want to be. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. There's not much to choose really between the last three years, but I've got a certain feeling for this Miss Mavis Armitage. I like the name. No, you know, I might no. even contact her. No, no. We no, never no, know. No, 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 <laughs> Mavis, your auntie's name is Armitage, isn't it? <laughs> Then he met Wendy Nightingale. He eventually asked her to move in with him, but her estranged husband Roger heard about it and he was less than pleased. Some people can compromise. You can't. You couldn't lead a half-and-half -half life involving both of us. I couldn't cope with that. I, I wouldn't even try. So, either you stop seeing me, forget that we ever met and go back to your life as it was before. I can't. You know damn well I can't. Then leave him and come and live with me. Are you really ready to make that sort of a commitment? Did you think I just wanted a casual affair? No. Just come in here, like. Come on, out! Get in! The last time Janet entered his life, she was clearly distressed, but Ken couldn't have guessed how things would turn out. He'd moved back in with Uncle Albert at number one by this time, and it wasn't convenient for Janet to stay, but what could Ken do? So, just for one night only, was the arrangement. Hello. This is the best place you could find. I was waiting for you. It would have been warmer at the Rovers. I didn't want to go in there. You've been waiting long? Not really. Oh, come on. Oh, don't blame Len. He did give me a message, said you were coming. But uh, you weren't very specific about the time. And I had a lot of appointments in town. That's OK. Right, well, uh, come on, let's go inside then. You do want to come in? Yes. It wasn't all bad, was it, Ken? With us? No, it wasn't all bad, Janet. But when it was bad, it was pretty bad. I've changed, Ken. What I've been through this last year does change you. No, no, people don't change, Janet, not really. Oh, sure, they get hurt, they get clobbered and flattened for a while, and then they're different. Or well, they seem different, their attitudes are different, tempered. But it doesn't last. The change is not permanent. Give me another chance, Ken. I'll settle down. We can bring the twins back No here. way, Janet! It was a mistake! The whole marriage bit was a mistake. We realised that and we made a decision on it, and it was the right decision. I don't want you back, Janet. Ever. I don't know what to do. Oh, you'll survive. Why do you go back to him, kiss and make up? I don't know where to go. There's nowhere to go. Well, if you like, I'll book you into a hotel. Can't somewhere. I stay here tonight? No, no. Just for what... tonight, Ken, oh, please. You're not being fair. It was you that left me, remember? You're no longer my bloody problem! No, of course.
course not. I'm sorry. Goodbye, Ken. Hang on. Look. Just for tonight. All right. If you want me to, it... No, I said all right. Thanks. Where... Where shall I sleep? Well, you can use my bed. I'll, I'll sleep down here. I'll get some blankets. Janet! Look, some of us do have jobs to go to, you know. Janet! Janet! You all right? After Janet's suicide, Ken felt that he couldn't face another serious relationship. He did have friends and went on dates. For instance, there was Sally Robson, Uncle Albert's chiropodist. Albert, in fact, right. it was Albert's well, little scheme that they should yeah, get yeah. together. You two have got one thing in common if it's not a dull folk. Actually, I'm dying to look at Ken's feet, Mr. Tatlock. Ooh. They're great character guides of feet. Yeah, well, I'll keep my feet to myself if you don't mind. I'm not a feet exhibitionist like some people I could name. <laughs> I must be going. Right, I'll see you. There are corns pulsating painfully all over town, waiting for me to deal with them. I'll see you next week, Mr. Tatlock. I hope so. Bye, Ken. Bye. I bet you've got some very nice feet. <laughs> yeah, they're stunning, actually. Bye. Bye. Same then there was yeah. Karen oh, Barnes. She wanted Ken to help her improve her reading and writing, and writing but people tended to get the wrong idea. Oh, I care. I never even had that at proper school. Or if we did, I never did it. Well, you didn't have the right kind of teachers, then. Oh, you again. I just wanted a word. Right, I'll see you on Monday. All right, fine, Bye. thanks. Well, come on in. Right, what can I do for you this time? Could I ask you a personal question, Ken? Far away. Well, what's your, you know, what's the connection between you and Karen Barnes? Well, why are you asking? Well, you know, an old man's a villain. He's on remand. He's in Risley at the moment. On remand? You didn't know, did you? No, no, I, I didn't know. Well, a word to the wise, mate. Being friendly with a con's wife is a very unhealthy pastime. In 1979, Ken started to see Deirdre on a regular basis, and not everyone was enthralled with the idea, particularly Uncle Albert. What's up? Aren't you speaking? I went into the railways after lunch. Annie Walker buttonholed me and tried to get in her two pennyworth about my private affairs. Well, that's typical. And on this occasion, she was well primed. By you. What are you talking about? You know full well what I'm talking about. You've been picking over my private affairs with Annie Walker. And anyone else who cares to listen, I dare say. Ina Sharples, no doubt. Your various boozing cronies. 
Well, my relationship with Deirdre is none of their business. And it's none of yours either, come well, to that. I'm entitled to speak. I'm family. You're not entitled to drag other people into it. Look, if I keep going on about it, it's just because I don't want to see you making a muck of your life. Oh, is that so? It is so. And if you wait, oh, you will be doing. Well, I haven't asked for your opinion. No, but you're getting it just the same. She's all wrong for you, you know. You'll be landing yourself in a whole lot of trouble. Oh, yes, and you're quite disinterested, of course, quite unselfish. What do you mean? Well, it's not just Deirdre, is it? You'd be against any woman that I was interested in. You think it might upset your comfortable little routine? Look, you've got no right to say that. Oh, haven't I? Well, you've got no right to interfere in my life. Now, I haven't asked for your advice, and until I do, I don't want to hear any more about it. Right. I'll say no more. You do just as you like. I'm going round to Legion. In spite of all the opposition, and not a little interference from Mike Baldwin, Ken and Deirdre finally got married in 1981. I bet you're both glad that's over. I enjoyed every minute of it. Oh, I couldn't stop shaking. Much happiness to your mouth. Thank you, Helen. May all your troubles be little ones. Oh. Unfortunately, less than two years later, that interference from Mike was to be the ruination of their marriage. When Deirdre admitted to Ken that she'd been having an affair with Mike, Ken was determined to know the truth. Hello? It's me. Oh, Mike. Listen, I, I can't talk now. Why, what's the matter? Nothing. I just can't talk now. I'll, uh, I'll speak to you later. Oh, no, you won't. I'm sorry to interrupt you all. Who's a little chap? No doubt there have been a good many of those over the past few weeks. Baldwin, of all people! You decide to have an affair to enliven the tedium of your marriage, and you have to go and pick a little creep like him! I didn't pick him! I didn't go looking for an affair. I didn't want an oh, affair. Oh, I see. It was an irresistible impulse. Was it written in the stars? This thing was bigger than both of I you. I hate you when you talk like that. What you hate is the truth! About your sordid little bit on the side with a spiv like Baldwin. At least he's human. At least he wanted me. I wanted you! You never wanted me, Ken, or kids, or anything. It's your pride that's hurt, that's all. That's not true, I'm afraid. I loved you. I'm the man you married. I'm exactly the same now as I was then, and if that wasn't what you wanted, why did you marry me? Oh, Ken. Ignore it. No. Why did you put the phone down on me? It's Ken. He knows. I've told him everything. Get out of this please. house. Get Shut up! up. I'm oh, warning you. Get out of this house. Here you go. Let's go. Well, needless to say, their marriage was never the same after that, but they both tried to patch it up with little success. In 1984, Uncle Albert died, and after the funeral, Beatty, Albert's daughter, gave Ken a little memento of him. Well, I suppose this is my dad's only really treasured possession, his military medal. Well, that should be worth something now. Actually, Ken knows exactly how much it's worth, don't you, love? Not now. Uncle Albert sold it when he needed some money to go down London for the armistice parade, and Ken bought it back for him. I never knew that. <laughs> It's all water under the bridge now. Here. You'd better have it, then. Well, I would like it, Beatty. Thank you. It was a very nice funeral, wasn't it? Sad, but everybody seemed to have happy memories of my father. Although Ken and Deirdre went to get divorced until 1992, life until then was far from uneventful for either of them. Ken had a platonic relationship with well, Sally Waterman at the newspaper back. office where they both worked, but Deirdre oh, had her doubts. Hello? Hello. In 1989, Wendy Crozier entered Ken's life. Wendy had joined the reporter a little time before, and it wasn't long before Deirdre began to harbour the suspicion that Ken was more interested in Wendy than he was in work. Hang on. You really only stopped off me to change my top. Well, get it changed then. It wasn't an excuse. Can't be in the office with Cod Mornay all down my front. One little speck, you entice me back, admit it. Skyver. I'm working my notice, aren't I? Beavering away until Friday. You have to quit. Well, I think it's best. And Deirdre's happy, isn't she? 
Hey, do you realise it's gone sick? I'm sorry. Oh, well, I missed two appointments and I'm supposed to be seeing Deirdre at half past. Time really flies when you're enjoying yourself. Yeah, as they say, uh, don't mind if I miss the tea, dear. Oh, not at all. Well, if you're rushing, I'd better organise myself. No, 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 no. You are OK. Thanks for the reference, but a touch tousel for the office, wouldn't you say? No, what I mean is you don't need to go tearing in. I'll just check the answer machine and then I'll uh, get straight after the Rovers. Otherwise, you were more than OK. No guilt, no regrets. We'll see. Office in the morning? 9am on the dot. And after the end of next week? Any night after seven, the occasional lunch, and if you can, swing a weekend. We'll talk about that. No, I didn't bring my briefcase, did I? No, but you did bring this. Oh, hallelujah, tireless in office hours. That would have looked bad. All this living separate lives, on top of trying to keep a family together for Tracy, was bound to have an effect on both of them. So when Ken discovered on New Year's Eve 1990 that Deirdre had gone to Paris with Phil Jennings, it was the last straw. He didn't see much point in carrying on, and if it hadn't been for an old friend, things might have been very different. Door won't closed. No. Are you on your own, or? On my own, yeah. This needed to be. Yeah. So, uh, if you don't mind, uh, please. How many have you taken? How many, Ken? Look, I just want to be left alone. How many? Well, however many I've taken, whatever I'm doing, it's none of your business, is it? It's none of anybody's business, so if you could just... Right. What are you doing? Ambulance. Three. That's all, three. No. It's all right, no, thank you. Three. And why? Why? Because, uh, because it's the best thing. It's never the best thing, Ken. Not that. No, uh, you don't understand. Try me. Bet managed to talk some sense into Ken, and eventually he recovered. Divorce from Deirdre was just a matter of time, and they both set about building new lives. Fortunately, in spite of all that had happened, they were able to remain friends. Ken attempted a relationship with Alma Sedgwick, who was on the rebound from Mike Baldwin, and just when things seemed to be going well, to his horror, Mike reappeared to ruin yet another relationship. Ken and Alma had gone away for the new year, and while having dinner, Alma had confessed that she'd been seeing Mike. Ken had left in a huff. In fact, he left Alma at the hotel. I thought I ought to come. I wouldn't have minded if you'd thought again. Look, I know I behaved very badly. Yes, you did, but it really doesn't matter anymore. May I come in all the same? This is pointless, is this? Not entirely. I do owe you an apology, that's the point. Oh, is it? Look, whatever the circumstances, it was extremely ungracious of me to behave the way that I did. Ungracious, was it? And inexcusable. And unforgivable. And I'm very sorry. And that makes you feel better, does it? You feel that bit more gracious. I mean, you like feeling gracious, don't you? There's not a lot I can do. I can't apologise, so I'm doing it. Well, I have to tell you, it doesn't make me feel one whit better. Not that I feel quite so worthless and rejected and 
rotten as you made me feel the other night. But that has got nothing to do with your apology. That is just a matter of time. Look, Alma... But if it makes you feel any more gracious, then just go on and apologise again and again and again. I mean, as often as you like, but it won't make any difference You have a right to, to be angry. Oh, I have a right. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me my rights. You're so bloody patronising. But you're not the only one. I had a right to be angry, and I was. There are many things that make me violent, and you turned up the only thing I can think of offhand. You lifted up a stone and out crawled Baldwin. And what should I have done? Not told you. If you'd been true to yourself, you'd have had nothing to do with him. Oh, of course, because he treated me badly, didn't he? He walked out on me. Mind you, he didn't choose a time when I was a hundred miles away, surrounded by strangers singing old Ang I don't understand how a woman can bear to be touched by a man like that. Yeah, well, it's a funny old world, isn't it? Been anybody else? Well, if it had been anybody else, you'd have forgiven me. Well, that would have been gracious. Don't you see? I see this. Your relationship with Mike Baldwin is far more important than your relationship with me ever was. I'm glad I found out, really, because I'm well out of it. And it was to happen again. When Ken met Maggie Redmond, their relationship was going along just fine. When, guess what? That's right, Mike turned up. But it wasn't because Maggie was in love with Mike that things turned sour. It was because she used to be. In fact, Mike and Maggie had a son called Mark. And when Mike arrived one Christmas with a present for him, Ken was stunned. His obsessive hatred of Mike welled up and ruined another relationship. Merry Christmas. I have a parcel for a master. Why are you wearing that stupid hat? And why are you wearing it here? Who is it? Oh, nothing. Somebody's just knocked at the wrong door. I don't like saying I told you so, but... Yes. I mean, I did say the more you let him see Mark, the more he's going to want. It isn't just what he wants, it's what Mark wants as well. Well, quite frankly, you've just got to put your foot down. I mean, you've got to stop that man before he... Oh. Hi. Well, yes. I am going to put my foot down. Good. I didn't mean with Mike. I meant with you. I can't stand all this sniping all the time. You know, you, you telling me what to do and going on about Mike. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, I thought you were asking my advice. Yes, well, it isn't exactly impartial advice, is it? I mean, you hate Mike. You told me that. I don't think I believed you before, but, oh, yes, you do. All right, so, uh, well, we just won't talk about it. <laughs> what else is there? Oh. We stop seeing one another. It's not what I want. I just can't stand any more of this. So you've got to shut one of us out of your life and decide it's going to be me. Well, wonderful. Yes, because that's exactly what Baldwin wants. You know that? It's all part of his master plan and you're playing right into his hands. You see, you're doing it now. We can't even talk about us without you going on about Baldwin, Baldwin, Baldwin. Win. Well, I've had enough, Ken. I'm sorry. I've just had enough. Ken settled down after that and kept himself to himself. During that time, he attempted to teach Raquel French. Not an easy task, as you can imagine. Set, we, nerf, dis. Good, good. Right, so let's imagine that you've gone into a shop, you've seen something that you like, and you say, combien? Amorch. And he says, wheat franc. Mademoiselle. Uh, thanks, lady. Yeah. 
Except I don't know what eighth ganks is worth, so that's not got me right far, is it? <laughs> well, you just get the exchange rate and you work that out. Oh, OK, well, suppose I'm buying... Um, Shoes. Is there something wrong with these or what? Uh, oh, no, 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 shoes, anything. Oh, oh, yeah, OK, then, um, shoes, well, um, find a shoe shop. A magasin de chaussures. And then I say... Should I see it and she'll say. Yeah, except you'd want two shoes, wouldn't you? I mean, one shoe wouldn't be a lot of use, would it? Should I see it to show, sir? Uh, yes, except you don't actually ask for two shoes. I mean, you wouldn't go into the shop and say, could I have two shoes? You'd say, some shoes. Look, any shoes in it, I think I'll buy them before I go. Because, I mean... <laughs> a year later, he was to meet someone who was destined to have a profound effect on his life. This was Denise Osborne. Now, she'd taken over the hairdressing salon on the corner of Coronation Street. And although she didn't take Ken seriously at first, she was eventually drawn to him. Their affair progressed rapidly. And one day, Denise had some news for Ken. But that's as far as it goes. And I now speak for Deirdre as well when I say there isn't a hint of anything um, sexual between us. Now, I put her on the bus and it's just a handshake and a quick peck on the cheek. Uncomplicated. Sounds very nice. But it is, it is, yeah. We're just rock solid good chums. You look doubtful. Oh, no, no, please don't think that. Now I was thinking about something quite different. Want to tell me? I'm going to have a baby. Saying, I'm not asking you to be involved, Ken. But I want a baby. Okay. I want to hold you. Uh, would you mind? Mind. <laughs> How's things? Fine. I was just telling Gail about my meeting. Oh, what meeting? Natural childbirth. You should have said. I'd, I'd like to have gone with you. Yeah, I'm sure you would, but I went on my own, okay? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, if you don't want me there, that's up to you, but be straight with me. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. It's just, it's complicated. I don't know, I don't know how far you want to get involved. I want to be completely involved. Well, you can't be, can you? It's not like we're married. We could be, if you wanted to be. I, I beg your pardon, was that a proposal? Wasn't a very romantic one, I know. <laughs> it certainly wasn't. But I did mean it. I would like to marry you, uh, if that's what you wanted. Oh, for crying out loud. Is that a yes or a no? I've got to get back to work. But you will think about it. I have a customer waiting. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll see you tonight. Sure. I'll look forward to it. The bottom line is that the baby needs two parents. She'll have two parents. Yeah, only Daddy is the man across the street. <sighs> right. Ken, I don't want you out alive. So what do you want? An occasional babysitter? More than that. But less than marriage. OK, OK, you say I'm asking for the wrong reasons. Don't agree, but tell me what would be the right reasons. Well, for one thing, if you loved me. But I care about you. Yeah, it's all right, Ken. I'm not in love with you either. You know, this baby is one of the biggest things that's ever happened to me. I want to be there when she takes that first breath. I want to hold her in my arms. 
You want to bond with her. That's right. <laughs> Listen. You know, isn't this all a bit hasty? I mean... Well, what if we fall out again and you never see her? <laughs> We're not going to, are we? I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't even imagine it. It's, it's like a foreign country. Yeah, well, I mean, our relationship is... A we haven't got a relationship, Ken. What we've got is a predicament. Well, you've been very good about things up to now, but... It's starting to wear a bit thin. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, all this hassling me about the name and the birth. I don't want to think about the birth, OK? <laughs> How many times have I said that now? Well, you're going to have to think about it sometime. No, I don't. I'm just going to wait for it to happen, and then I'm going to close my eyes until it's all over. Well, all I'm saying is I want to be there with you. No, no, what you were saying was if you were there, you'd be bonding away with my baby. Our baby. You see, you're saying that if I let you into the birthplace, that's as good as marrying you. That's what you're saying. It's a commitment. Yeah, but I don't know what sort of commitment, do I? That's up to you. It's up to me. <laughs> Fine, well, I don't want you there at the birth. Hmm. That's what you want. I don't want you there at the birth, and I don't want you in my life. What? You heard me. I want this baby to have everything I can give her. I want her to have a fresh start. I'm not having her spending her first few days sitting around the fag ash of the burnt out relationship. But it didn't be like no, that. No, that's right. That's why I'm finishing it now. This is going to be the start of a new life. For me. For her. You can't do this to me. I can do anything I like. No, hide. please, please, Denise. You, this is very meaningful to me. Look, I had children when I was much younger. I made a complete mess of it. Now, by some miracle, I've been given another chance. I want to be there for her from the very first moment. Yeah, that's another reason why. It's all over. I am not having my baby turned into some kind of therapy for you. I didn't mean it like that. I, 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 that... I, me, me, me. This isn't about you. This is about my baby. You don't even come into it at all. Well, of course it's got something to do with me. I'm the father. And of course it's got something to do with me. I live down the road. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Watch you pushing the pram around and feel nothing? I don't... Just, just a minute. Just say, oh, yeah, that's the one that got away. I don't care about what you feel. I don't care about you at all. All I care about is my baby. No. Get out. You're upsetting me. I'm upsetting you. Yeah, that's right. You're upsetting me. It's bad for my baby. Get out. Don't get out. That more or less set the tone of Ken and Denise's relationship. And although Ken was at the birth, things never really got any better between them. The end came when Ken found out that Denise was having an affair with her brother-in-law, Brian. Finally, Denise left for good, but she left Ken holding the baby, a responsibility he was more than happy to take on. It's all right, Ken. I haven't come round to plead with you anymore. I've come round to tell you that I'm leaving. With Brian? Yeah. So much for it being over. It was. Oh, uh, I don't know whether I'm doing the right thing. But there's nothing here for me. Not unless you can find it in your heart. To... Huh? No. So I have to at least try to make things work some other way. And have you thought about how Daniel fits into these plans of yours? Yes. Look, you're not just picking him up like an overnight bag and walking through the door with him, Denise. That's not fair, and I won't let you do it. No, I'm not taking him anywhere with me. You were right. I'm not a fit mother. 
I never will be. And I don't know if things are going to work out with Brian. They never have with anyone else. And if they don't and I end up moving on, it, it, it wouldn't be fair on Dan. I do know that people around here are going to say that I'm cruel and callous. I can give him love. I can give him all the love he needs. I can't give him security. He's better off with you. I'd better pack a bag. Would you take him from me, please? Take him for a change of my mind. And that's where we must leave, Ken. I hope you've enjoyed this look at a character who, during 35 years of life in the street, has given us more than a fair share of tears and excitement. I look forward to you joining me again when I take another stroll down Coronation Street. For now, goodbye. Thank you.